was in that generation who basically had, had thought that, well, God isn't real anymore. They'd given up on the biblical God. It was that generation after Darwin and, and that, and many of them just thought, we can't believe in this anymore. But Hardy, this affected Hardy. Uh, let me quote you from the, that poem. And you've got to imagine that what he's, he's imagining is God is being buried as if in a coffin. And you've got all these people who are carrying the coffin of God. And here they are, it says, So toward our myth's oblivion, darkling and languid-lipped, we creep and grope, sadlier than those who wept in Babylon, whose Zion was a still abiding hope. Whose Zion was still, was still abiding hope. What, what Hardy is getting at is, is that not, when we've buried God, and we don't believe in God anymore, we don't have any hope. We've lost hope talks about those in ba Babylon you know when those people wept in Babylon at least they had hope of a return to the land of promise at least they still believed in their God oh yes they've been carried away yes the Babylonians had destroyed the temple but there was still hope there was still a possibility that God in fact he'd even promised would build the temple restore them to the land there was hope there's always hope for those who believe in God but for Hardy we've lost God We've lost hope and I think this is characteristic of many uh, particularly uh, some intellectuals shall we say who've given up on this idea of God and the hope that comes with it and and if you've read any of his novels and uh, you may have been you might be unlucky enough to have done so uh, Judy Obscure it's one of those books where something's happening and and it's pretty bad but then there's a glimmer of something good is going to happen Things are going to work out for Joe, Jude. And then Hardy slams the door shut on any hope and it all goes wrong again for Jude. And then he builds it up again. Maybe things, no, bang, and bang. And it's relentless in its lack of hope. Those novels are all bleak. It always goes wrong, doesn't it, in a Thomas Hardy novel, if you ever watch Montali or whatever. And that reflects him. But here's the thing for us. When times are tough, where do we find comfort and hope? Where do we find comfort and hope? Well. What did, our, what did our author say here? Did you see what he said? We, I read from verse 19. He talked about my affliction, my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul remembers it and is bowed down within me. My soul is bowed down within me. He really felt this weight of the terrible stuff that happened. What had happened? Jerusalem had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. Many people had been killed. They were reduced and I won't go into any details, they were reduced to cannibalism. That's how bad it was. That's what the scripture actually says. I'm not making that up. That's how bad it was. And many were exiled to Babylon. What an awful situation that must have been. How deeply distressing that was. And yet, he says in verse 21, right in the middle of this very dark dirge of a poem, he says in verse 21, but this I call to mind. My soul is bowed down, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. What is he calling to mind? Why does this give him hope? He says in verse 22, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That's what the ESV translation says. Now your translation, I don't know what you have, may be slightly different. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. So let's come to that. So this is the light in this dark place. Now, why, what do we have in our different English translations? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. I don't know what translation you've got in front of you. If you've got the NIV, it'll say the great love of the Lord. Uh, if you've got uh, the King James Version, it's steadfast love, like the ESV. If you've got the New King James Version, I think it says the mercies of God. And Miles Coverdale and the NASB have the loving kindness. All these different words for this the steadfast love of the Lord. Well, that steadfast love is one word in Hebrew, and the, the English translators are trying to translate this. And this is what gives Jeremiah hope, and it is the same thing that gives you and I hope when things are bad. Yes, I know you haven't been through the exile. None of you are that old, so you're all young. You haven't been, uh, you haven't had the temple destroyed because we don't have a physical temple like that. 
The only temple that was destroyed is the body of the Lord Jesus, which was raised again on the third day. But what is, what's going on here? Well, let me, let me say to you, the reason these translators have come up with different words is because this word is so rich. This word is like a diamond with many different facets. And so we, we need to explore this word so that you can see why for Jeremiah this was such a hope. Because although we can use the word love, that's not a wrong word to use, it's so much deeper because a word like love can mean so many different things to different people, can't it? What does love mean after all? It's a, it's a difficult thing. You have to explain. What do you mean? So let's talk about what is this love that gives hope and then why why that was a hope for Jeremiah. Well, I'm, I'm going to say to you that the, the steadfast love of the Lord means this. So bear with me, but I want you to just ponder on this. It means that God initiates, that means he begins and sustains, that means he keeps going, a relationship with his people according to his mercy for their good. The steadfast love of God is this, that he initiates and sustains a relationship with his people according to his mercy not based on their merit for their good and I get that from other places where this word is used in scripture Exodus 34 6 to 7 again a well-known verse of scripture the Lord the Lord God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love there's our word again and faithfulness keeping steadfast love there's the word again for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation, which we won't go into because that's another sermon in and of itself. But can you see in there the elements there in which God is this God who initiates a relationship with what did he what did he done with Israel? Israel wasn't in, in, in uh, going around going, oh, you know, we, let's start a relationship with God. No. God comes down, he saves them, he acts in Egypt, he sends the plague, he separates the water, he brings them into the promised land. It's him, him, he does it all the time. God initiates it. And was it what was it based on? Was it because Israel was the greatest nation in the world? No. Was it because they were the best and the most moral of all nations? No. God explicitly says, I didn't save you because you were good, because you were better, but because I set my love upon you you why do you do that he did <laughs> why Israel because he did because God picked Israel he initiated a relationship with Israel and let's face it they weren't that good were they and the whole Old Testament is about how bad they were really in some respects with all due respect there's a few exceptions even their ancestors the patriarchs who are they're named after Israel and all these people even Abraham a bit sketchy in places you know Offering your wife, saying your wife's your sister and all that kind of stuff. A bit sketchy, isn't it? And yet, God loved Abraham. God set his love upon these people. And it wasn't... And, and, and here's the other thing. Not only does God initiate this relationship out of his steadfast love, he sustains it. Remember what Israel did with the golden calf. God's up on the mountain. He's giving with Mo, Mo, Moses up on the mountain with God. God is giving the Ten Commandments. What's Israel doing? They're going, oh, great, God. We're, we're, we're really faithful to you, God. We're just waiting for you. No, they're making a molten image of a calf and saying, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. A load of baloney. And God comes down, and yes, there is a judgment there, but God continues with Israel. Yes, there was a consequence. Yes, they spent 40, day, 40 years in the wilderness, but did they get to the promised land? Yes, they did. Did they? did God continue with Israel through all the ups and downs, through David and Solomon, through all the kings, and down to the time when a Messiah was born from the seed of David? Yes, God continued with them. And I believe still to this day. But that's another sermon, how that works out. But anyway, there we are. That's Romans 9 to 11. But that's another one. God continued in that relationship with them not based on their goodness. You see, can you see just something of this love of God initiating, sustaining a relationship with a people who don't deserve it for their good. That is the same God and the same steadfast love that is toward you in the new covenant. 
in the covenant that you have, in the relationship that you have with God through Jesus Christ. You know, we, we, the most famous verse in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the same kind of love we're talking about. It's not based upon your goodness. It's not that you initiate, you know, I didn't go looking for God. God came looking for me and saved me. You know, I started to look for him because he'd already started working in my heart to seek after him. God initiated that relationship. Was it because I was a nice boy from Haverhill? No, it wasn't. It was not. I was a sinner. And God initiated it not based on my goodness, and he did the same in your life, not based upon who you are, where you come from. He initiated it out of love. And have we failed God in this relationship? Does that mean God is, is, is said, oh, that's it, you've blown it now? No. God sustains that relationship. He remains faithful to that relationship. Forgiving us our sins. What does the New Testament say if we are faithful? We say without, without sin. Uh, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We come back to him. He is faithful. He continues that relationship with us. It's an ongoing commitment. It's why in Deuteronomy 7 it says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is, a, is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And so this is something we can rely on. God's steadfast love continues. Not just his past mercies, but something that will continue. So that's the first thing. That's the steadfast love of the Lord. Now the second point then of the three is that the steadfast love of the Lord, what does it say? Never ceases. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Well, I hope you memorize this verse and, and keep it forever in your heart because it's so precious. God is an eternal God. God is eternal. And I want you to stop for a moment and you could be thinking about what's for lunch today. You could be thinking, what about X or Y that's going into my life? And that's all legitimate and understandable. But let's just pause for a moment from our where we are with our feet on this grass in this particular moment and go, who is God? Who is God? What is he like? He is eternal. He is unchanging. That's why he's called a rock. There's no shadow of change in him. And therefore his love is also eternal. Invariant. It doesn't change. It's utterly committed. He doesn't begin something. You know, like we start a job sometimes. Some of us are complete finishers. Some of us are kind of, I love starting something new, but don't always finish it off. I'm not going to, we're not going to name names. Um, but God isn't a sort of a, a guy who goes, I've got a really great idea and starts it off, but then doesn't see it through. God is not like that. I, I've, I, I've done that a few times. You know, great idea. Oh, well, let's go and do that. Get all excited about it. And then the enthusiasm goes. And if, and we could be like that in our relationships, couldn't we? Like someone, we're really keen on somebody, romantically or not. We could just, you know, that friendship could be very warm and then just kind of fades. Or it could be that we're romantically connected with someone and then it just sort of fizzles out. Humans can be like that. But God is unchanging and eternal. When he sets his love upon a people, and in Jesus Christ, if you trust in Jesus Christ, he has done that to you. He doesn't go, oh, well, I quite liked, quite liked him, but you know, that was, that was so 2020, 2019. That was so 2017. I'm just past that now. I'm into new... No, God is not like that. He doesn't have whims. And that's really important. We struggle to believe this because we experience the shortcomings of others, don't we? And we're aware of our own. What I mean is, we, we, we say, well, hold on, how can God be a God who's so utterly committed that he will never change his disposition of steadfast love towards me in Jesus Christ? And the reason we struggle with that is because we've had so many experiences of other people and going, well, they've let us down. They failed. And then, well, I failed too sometimes. But we mustn't judge God 
by our human experience. This is what people do all over the place, isn't it? When I talk to people, so often the problem is you say, well, why do you think God's like that? Well, you know, but, but God is like this, this eternal God. He's not the God like, like you and I. He doesn't fail like that. We mustn't do that. And, and God's love is eternal. It doesn't begin. It doesn't end. Now, when I say God's love is eternal and doesn't begin, you've got to know God's love doesn't begin. There wasn't a time when God suddenly went, oh, I think today I'm going to start loving you. There wasn't, that day didn't happen. Did you know that? In all of our relationships of love, it always began on a certain point in time, didn't it? So when did my love for my sons begin? Well, I don't know, but it probably was more or less, might have been before they are born, but most likely it was from their birth, I suppose. It probably should have been before they were born, really. I don't know. I, I can't remember, really. It should have been before they were born, shouldn't it? Probably, maybe it was, to some extent. But it certainly began in time. What about my wife? love for my wife? Well, I didn't love her before I met her, did I? In fact, I didn't even love her the moment I saw her, which, you know, sorry, it, you know, it didn't work that way. Should have done, but it didn't, but it came later. But it came at a point in time, didn't it? And that's the same for all of us. We start <coughs> loving at a point in time. God, though, is eternal. His love is eternal. The love for the Father and the Son and the Spirit for each other, that's just eternal. It's outside of time. You say, but I don't understand that. Quite right. If you think you understand it entirely, you don't understand what I'm saying. You can't fully understand that, but it's still true. The Father's always loved the Son. The Son's always loved the Father. And guess what? The Scripture says that in Christ, God loved you before the foundation of this little world. However old that is, and that's another sermon, but it doesn't begin in time. God's eternal love towards his people. God is a trinity. God is three persons, one God, a community of love. God doesn't need anything, but he offers his love to us. And then, and, and, and I just love the fact that he goes on to say here, he says, his mercies never come to an end, which I think is, is, is sort of parallel to that. His steadfast love doesn't cease. His mercies never come to an end. It's saying much the same thing. But then, Day. verse 23 his mercies are new every morning now I like to think of it like this think of Jeremiah everything's gone wrong hasn't it what a nightmare Jerusalem's fallen exile the darkness of all of that and yet he says but they're new every morning every morning your mercies are new you know that word morning every daybreak every sunrise isn't that beautiful when that sun rises every day, and that happens, it happened this morning, didn't it? And I was, I didn't sleep very well this, last night, to be quite honest. Not that you, that you really want to hear about that, but, but I, I see, you know that, that time of night when you're like, how, what time is it? You know, so I get up, <coughs> uh, that sort of thing. Is it just me? No, it's not, is it? And then you got to that point where like, oh, I can see a glimmer of light around the, the sun sort of coming up, right? Every day that happens, the darkness of night is broken by the sunrise. And what, what Jeremiah is saying is whatever has happened with Jerusalem, there is the sunrise that is a token, the symbol, that God's steadfast love rises on every dark situation. That comes about every single day. It's a token and a reminder, the, the, the return of the sun every day. We're supposed to get up in the morning and go, the sun has risen. And that means God's mercy to me will not fail, has not failed, will continue, world without end. That's what we're, we don't do that. We go, oh, well, I wonder if it's six o'clock, should I put the kettle on? But we should say, look at that. The sun has risen. The darkness, symbolically speaking, is being dispelled by the sun of his, his eternal steadfast love, which shines upon my life and yours through Jesus Christ. That's what we should be saying. That's what we should see. Isn't that beautiful? And so the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And where do we see this love most supremely demonstrated? It is demonstrated concretely and absolutely clearly in an event 2,000 years ago. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. How do you know that? Because Jesus Christ, God's Son, was sent into the world for you. He died as God's Son for you. He came and died 
for you to pay for your sins to cover them completely he died a criminal's death taking upon himself the wrath of God that whoever believes in him whether we're from Peru from Suffolk from Pakistan from wherever in the world from every tongue tribe and nation whoever believes in him whether we've got black skin white skin whatever color skin who cares God's made us all if we believe in him we have everlasting life and his steadfast love remains on us forever that is the sign the sure sign that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases Jeremiah never saw it although he knew from the prophecies that Messiah would come and so finally thirdly what's our application it's what Jeremiah says here isn't it verse 21 therefore I have hope verse 24 therefore I will hope in him he says it twice therefore you know what they say about a therefore in scripture don't you whenever there's a therefore in scripture you've got to ask what it's therefore, therefore. what's it there for it's therefore because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases therefore I will have hope in him in other words I will have hope in this God of steadfast love you know we live in a fallen changeable world um, I just finished uh, the other day a book by uh, a, an atheist and I mentioned that it's important a guy called John Gray I'm quite I quite enjoy his books he wrote something called the immortalization commission the immortalization commission the immortalization commission was a committee or a, or a group in Soviet Russia what was their job if you go to Red Square today I've never been there I want to go there if you go, if you go there in Red Square to this day is still the embalmed body of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin embalmed there in the 1920s why did they do that you know they did that with Mao it's in, in Tiananmen Square as well they did it with Lenin why did they embalm his body do you know why because they hoped and believed that given enough time through science and technology they'll be able to bring him back to life again did you know that that's amazing to think that they think that they, they've been arguing about this for ages because they wanted to kick his body out because basically they don't believe in all that stuff anymore but it's still there but what did they have their hope in they had their hope in science and technology for the resurrection from the dead but what did Jeremiah say therefore I hope in not science I hope in him I hope in this God of steadfast love and I mentioned that because we can put our hope in all sorts of things can't we we could put it in politicians I think some of us a certain age go yeah not very likely but we might do might not we but here what other things might we put our hope in when it's dark when things have gone wrong what do we put our hope in money people put a hope in money don't they let's be honest it's quite it's quite common actually if I can make enough money if I can have enough money things will go well in my life that's what people put their hope in isn't it money what else do people put their hope in people put their money in status don't you know who I am I've risen to a certain position you have gotta treat me with a certain deference I've arrived oh he's done well for himself I'm in this position and people hope in it they place their trust in it their sense of who they are and their hope that it will shield them from the worst of what the world can do to them and you can see why these sorts of things are appealing and they sometimes temporarily work they can do to an extent for a temporary time what else do people do they're in their reputation well, we all want a good reputation but some people hope in that all their achievements well I've done this and I've done that and I've got this qualification or I've got I've achieved this particular thing and people say now look at what I've done or in their talents their skills their family don't you know who I'm connected to don't you know my surname have you heard of us or your goodness here's a real danger for Christians isn't it to trust in your own goodness don't you know how often I go to church or I do this or I, I do and they can be good things in and of themselves but we trust in our goodness and we're subtly displacing our true hope which should be in the Lord himself the Lord is my righteousness the Lord is my salvation not me 
What else do we trust him? Our intelligence or, or some other things, our goodness, our religiosity, fame, power, all sorts of other things. But what does Jeremiah say? I will hope in him. That's what we need to do. And if that's the case, we need to be in the waiting game. He just says here towards the end, doesn't he? Um, verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. And verse 26, it is good that one should wait quietly. The scripture very often makes waiting and hoping basically the same thing, synonymous. <coughs> waiting. We're in the waiting game. Because the one thing I can, I can say to you today, if you believe in the Lord Jesus who was raised from the dead, he will raise your mortal body as well. That's true, isn't it? That's what the scripture says. But I can't click my fingers and make it happen, and you don't see it right now. You've got to wait for it. You've got to trust that when the Lord Jesus does come again, if you're still alive, he will bring us to himself at that moment. You've got to hope that when your body goes and is buried in the grave, that the Lord Jesus will raise it up. That's what my hope is. I know I'm going to go in that grave one day, right? Or the Lord will come before that. That's what my hope is. But I can't see it now. I've got to wait for that. And that means we're in this sort of delayed gratification. Have you heard of delayed gratification? Have you ever heard about that experiment where they took these kids, little kids, and they said to them, pretty cruel really, they said to them, you can have one marshmallow now, or I'm going to go out the room for 15 minutes, and if you don't eat that one marshmallow, I'll give you two when I come back in. Have you ever heard about that sort of thing? It's a little test to see, and they, some kids took the one, uh, straight away because oh there's that one I'll have it mm. and others went and, and they, they, they closed their eyes and they were you know little kids doing this and they, they tried ways to stop themselves from having that marshmallow that they really wanted but that's a kind of humorous thing they said that people the kids who delayed it and had the second one would do well in life because they're able to say no to their current desires and in a way we're in that game aren't we as well as Christians saying we have to say no to sin. We have to say, I'm going to walk in a way that the world doesn't understand and because I'm going to live for the hope that I have. But then finally, we're in the business, not just of waiting, but we're in the business of love. Now I said that um, a lot of people have given up on, uh, if, you live, if you lose belief in God, you lose really the hope or you have to put it in something else which is flaky. Uh, and, and what we're seeing, I think, increasingly is a world where it's very legalistic, censorious. Um, and I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about out in the world. That seems to be what's happening. You've got to do this, you shouldn't do that. And there's all these things going on. But the, script, the Christians, the Christian way is like this in 1 John. We know 1 John says God is love. But what does it also say? Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another really you can't go much far wrong by, by having that can you? the center of what it is to be a Christian our lives are to imitate the steadfast love of the Lord so where do we love think about this where do we love we love in the places we find ourselves or rather where God has placed us God has placed us within your family hasn't he he's placed you in your unique family situation you're to be a person of steadfast love in that particular family it's not my family, your family. And I've got to love in my family. Uh, what about in your church? We've got to imitate the steadfast love of the Lord in Stonham Baptist Church. It's no good talking about it elsewhere. It's, it's got to be here, hasn't it? It starts here. It starts with me here now. In the local community where you've placed, in your workplace, in your school. How do we love? It's with this steadfast, committed love. You see, our love is to reflect this committed love that God has not a fleeting love not a sort of here today gone tomorrow love but a, a committed love that sticks with people even when they fail us mess up or a pain in the neck difficult blah 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 and we're like that sometimes too in case you haven't realized sometimes maybe not all, maybe you're really nice but there are some people like that I'm one of them sometimes I'm pretty rubbish too but we've got to be sticking and that's the hard thing isn't it because we know in those relationships people fail and I, this is so tough, but it is right. 
if God has loved me with a love that will not let me go, here's the question for you. Do others feel that your love for them is fashioned after the steadfast love of the Lord? Our love should mirror his. Let me close with a a verse from Psalm 23, which uh, we sung sort of something to do with this. Surely goodness and it says mercy, but it's the same word, steadfast love. Surely goodness and steadfast love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's God's promise to you. It's his promise to you. Surely goodness and steadfast love will follow you all the day of your life if you trust in the Lord, and you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, praise God for that. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. <coughs> We are going to close by uh, singing, uh, we'll, and then, um, no, sorry, uh, before we do, we, we should pray uh, just for some of the needs of the church, and then 